Army Fire Rescue, and I am the second oldest person in the fire service, the oldest being Mike Dugan, uh, retired from the FDNY. We have a very small group today, but a very, uh, how shall we say, intimate group. Uh, also, Clark Lamping from the Clark County Fire Department in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, I want to thank our sponsors this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you're at in this country. Keyhose, that's keyfire.com. Uh, as I say in every one of these hangouts, I use this hose on my company. Uh, you will never go wrong with key. Uh, they have various grades. I happen to be fortunate enough, and I'm very proud to say that my department does not go cheap on hose. Uh, we buy the best, and the best is Key Combat Ready, and it's, it strikes the best balance of uh, uh, mobility, maneuverability, uh, abrasion, and heat resistance. Great flow capacity in terms of low friction loss and um, kink resistance that is amazing. So a good shout out for Key. Um, as I said, uh, just briefly, I made an introduction. I've been on the fire service now for 42 years. I'll be again with the Wheaton Fire Department in uh, 20 miles uh, west of Chicago. And I've been a captain with Miami-Dade now. And on their job for 38 years, uh, I was very proud and blessed to have a father that was a, a, a lieutenant on the Chicago Fire Department. In fact, he was on the, one of the, uh, or the first snorkel, that's an articulating boom apparatus, uh, in the history of the fire service, and if you're a fire apparatus buff, that would be that little old GMC that was actually a, a tree trimming uh, truck at one time that they converted to a snorkel. So, Mike, if uh, you could give a little detail on your background and uh, what you bring to the table, and then we'll ask Clark to do the uh, the young guy in the room. Uh, if you could go ahead, Mike. Sure. My name's Mike Dugan. I'm a retired captain from the FDNY. I started in the volunteer fire service in uh, 1973 uh, in a small town called Hale Site, New York, uh, where Nathan Hale was supposedly captured and hung by the British. Um, I was a volunteer there, and then in 1985, I was lucky enough to be called by the uh, New York City Fire Department, and I went on the job in the city. And I retired a couple of years ago because I fell down a flight of stairs at a job and I tore my knee up. And um, thank goodness they have the technology they do today because they replaced my knee. And um, it's all uh, it's all good. It's all good. So um, I'm very happy with that. But I'm still involved with fire engineering quite a bit. I thank fire engineering, Bobby Halton, for allowing me to be part of this. And I also thank Kehoe's for being our sponsor and making this possible. And uh, we're going to be talking to you today about a couple of different things. Uh, one, we're going to be talking about using whys and um, how they work, which is very, very foreign to me. Coming from the New York City Fire Department background, uh, we don't do it, and I'll talk about it when we get into the discussion. But that's my background, and uh, I'll turn it over to Clark. Good morning, everybody on the West Coast. Good afternoon, everyone on the East Coast. I'm Captain Clark Lamping with the Clark County Fire Department here in southern Nevada. If you've ever been to Las Vegas and spent any time on the Strip, Las Vegas Boulevard, you are actually in Clark County and not Las Vegas proper. Um, I work on Las Vegas Boulevard, Firehouse 11, Engine and Truck, and a Rescue Unit. I've been on the job for 18 years, and I am honored to be on this Google Hangout with these very, very experienced fire captains. And uh, I'm going to learn something about this today myself. Yes, and Clark, would you explain that the word experience is a euphemism for old and wrinkled up? Yes, that's uh, that was the, I was trying trying to be nice. I was trying to be nice, but yes, these two old guys I'm on the Google chat with me. Now, Mike, you mentioned something about uh, wise, and you said that uh, to paraphrase you, in your world, in the FDNY, it's not something that you use very often. And uh, Mike, you bring up an excellent point. Uh, when we formed this group, this this panel, uh, we we wanted to pick a diverse uh, background. Uh, Clark certainly is in a different world in terms of his responsibilities on the fire service than you are, Mike, and definitely me in in, in southeast Florida or the Chicago area where I came from. Uh, our our panels, uh, are there members that are 
not able to be with us this, this week, Daryl Liggins from Oakland, uh, California, uh, Dan Shaw from the D.C. area of Fairfax County, and Jason Hovelman from uh, the Heartland, uh, St. Louis. We all bring different things from the table, and if we, when we, and when we engage in these discussions, sometimes we disagree. And Mike, I think you said it best when you said. In fact, I'm going to ask you to repeat what you told me in a previous about being right and being wrong when it comes to opinions on how we do things in the fire service, Mike, if you were Well, call. just because you and I disagree, it doesn't make me right or you wrong or me wrong and you right. There are many ways to go about this. And this came from, we got this from um, other people. This has been passed down all the time. And uh, Tommy Brennan was famous for saying this. Just because we do disagree doesn't make one of us wrong and one of us right. There are different ways to do it, like everything else. Okay? There are different tools to do a job. There are different ways to do a job. We're all doing the job. So we have to have respect for each other's opinions, ideas, and what works for each of us. Because we are not always going to agree on the way things happen. There are plenty of things in a fire service that I don't do and I don't agree with but the guys and I'll be very honest a lot of times the East Coast versus the West Coast the guys are like they don't know what they're doing they don't know they know what they're doing my buddy Mike Galliano goes on um, lightweight roof buildings all the time to vent the roof of buildings in the FDMY we would never do that doesn't mean they're wrong doesn't mean we're wrong it's the way we go about putting out the fires and it's okay to have differing styles and different ways to do things. The biggest key to that is that everyone in your department, your company, your firehouse, they're all on the same page. All right. It is all about how you do it. It's, it's all about how you do it. All right, let me paint a scenario. Let me paint a picture for you. You have a fire in a courtyard apartment complex. And the okay, load. just because not all of our listeners understand what a courtyard a complex is, okay. explain it to them, Bill. All right. These are buildings that are built basically around in a, in a configuration around a courtyard where the emphasis is on landscaping rather than parking. The entrances are not directly accessible to a parking lot. You're going to have to walk a distance in order to get into your uh, to the interior of your building hence getting to the main or the alpha side or the side of one of these buildings uh, is inaccessible to fire apparatus typically which mean requires long stretches that can be increased geometrically by dumpsters illegally parked cars and our brothers in blue in police cars, where we may have to stretch hundreds of feet of hose just to get to the entrance of the apartment. Now, herein lies the controversy. How do we get that hose line several hundred feet from the apparatus to where we're going to operate it at the entrance of this fire building, which could be the base of the stairs at the beginning of the, or at the inside of a courtyard. Now, most of this fire service outside of your world, Mike, is going to stretch a relatively large diameter hose, such as two and a half or three inch hose, and attach a Y or a water thief, a Y being two outlets usually of uh, either the same or smaller diameter, or a water thief, which is going to have uh, one two-and-a-half inch outlet and two uh, inch-and-a-half outlets, uh, to the base of the building and, in a sense, move the pump panel up to an inside of the courtyard where we will control the flow. Now, I'm going to play my own devil's advocate. Is that putting a lot of our eggs, if not all of our eggs, in one basket, uh, dependent upon one trunk or supply line? The 
the answer is absolutely yes. And in some people's world, that just is not acceptable or desirable. In my world, it's just something we work with and something that we do due to our staffing and, and uh, the way our apparatus is set up. That's what works in our world. We stretch three-inch hose. We have a 600-foot bed of three-inch hose with a two-and-a-half to two-and-a-half to two-and-a-half inch gated wide. We will stretch that several hundred feet into a courtyard, down a rail siding, uh, into a trailer park, all of which is inaccessible to our apparatus, outside the range of preconnects. And that is the measure of a good engine company outside of the big city. How do you operate when you're outside the range of preconnect? How do we do it? Almost always, we're going to stretch a larger diameter hose, in our case, three inch with a gated Y. Now, as I said, I'm going to play my own devil's advocate. Do we put all our eggs in one basket or at least limit ourselves and our capabilities? Yes, we do. Uh, also, could there be flow or pressure control problems uh, operating hose lines from a gated Y that's supplied with a larger diameter hose such as two and a half or three inch? The answer is absolutely. If you don't do it right, and we're going to spend a large portion of today discussing how to do it right, because I think through our tests and Clark's tests in, in the Las Vegas area, I think we got a way to get it right and minimize the problems that uh, you can have with an over-reliance on, on, on a Y appliance. Okay, now having said that, here, here's a plug for key hose again. There are, is a kind of a, um, an unwritten cardinal rule in the fire service. Let's don't stretch any more than uh, a, a line any greater than 300 feet of inch and three-quarter hose. Well, I really think ladies and gentlemen that are watching us, those rules have changed a long time ago because of two things. One is low pressure nozzles, where we're not relying on nozzles that operate at a nozzle pressure of 50 PSI. Or, I'm sorry, 100 PSI. 100 PSI. The norm today is a nozzle that operates at 50 or 75 PSI, which gives you an additional 25 or 50 PSI pressure to be used to overcome the friction loss in, an, in a longer hose line of inch and three quarter. The next thing, and the big thing, and what really is a, is a selling point for key and other high quality hose like key combat ready is it's amazing friction loss. Where when you're flowing 185 gallons a minute at 25 pounds friction loss, can you see where you could stretch? 400, 500, 600 feet of inch and three quarter and still have an acceptable pump discharge pressure. So there, I just gave you an alternative to the Y. However, it doesn't give you the capability of flowing two lines right up close. Now, having said that, I played my own devil's advocate. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the, the program over to Clark for a minute because I know in Clark's world, he does operate with Y. And again, it is not in a perfect world, everybody. In a perfect world, we would have enough staffing, and we would be able to position an apparatus close enough to stretch relatively short lines into a fire building. But we do not operate in a perfect world. We operate in a world where we may have the apparatus may be hundreds of feet away from where we need to deploy our hose line. Clark, I know because I spent a little time in the Las Vegas area. Uh, it, uh, by the way, the last time I was there, Clark, I really want to thank you, man, for giving me that get out of jail free card. I don't know what I was doing. I woke up and finally, and thanks for coming to bail me out. And I really appreciate the hospitality of the Clark County, uh, I think it's Metropolitan Police Department. You guys were all so good to me. Just kidding, for God's sake. So, Mark, uh, Clark, young guy in the room, talk about the way you use Ys in Clark County. First, I've got a question for you, Captain Gustin. Um, so, when you're using a Y, you're using your three and a half, three inch trunk line, and then you're gating that down to inch and three quarter attack lines, correct? Most of the time, yes. Okay. And we, we try very hard to 
keep the lines the same length and the same flow. Typically, those are 100-foot extension packs Correct. that are bundled and strapped in an extension in a bundle fold with 15, 16 solid tip nozzles. Okay, both of them 15, 16 solid tip. We really strive to keep the lines the same flow, the same pressure. That's one of the shortcomings of using a Y, Clark. And I, I, I can, I can read your mind here. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's, it's like a small book, very sp short story. But I'm reading it right now. That it's not even a book. It's more like a pamphlet. Is that if you try to use different lengths, different flows, different pressures? Becomes problematic. Correct. And uh, one thing that I think we're doing wrong, Captain Gustin, is we're using inch and three-quarter line. Our trunk line is two and a half. We do not have three-inch trunk line, so everything is two and a half. And we use it exactly the same way you use it for this particular application. And it's one of the only times we do use our gated Y. We have a two and a half to inch and a half to inch and a half gated Y. And uh, we would absolutely use it. We have packs specially designed for this application. Um, garden style is what we call it on the West Coast. These uh, apartment complexes we've been talking about, it's a very, very popular architecture style in the Las Vegas area and in the Southwest. And so we have a lot of these a lot of these buildings in our in our area. So we specially designed this pose lay for this application. Now the difference is we are using uh, inch and three quarter fog nozzles on the ends of ours which I can see causing us some problems the testing we have done it's going to cause us some problems with the friction loss and which the higher higher pressures we're going to have to pump these to overcome the uh, the friction loss for these nozzles so yes um, our typical complement is 100 feet two separate hose lines of 100 feet of inch and three quarter with inch and three quarter fog nozzles um, supplied by a two and a half inch trunk line okay let me start to play my own devil's advocate again. Can I ask a question before you get too far, Bill? Yes, sir. How on these buildings that you call courtyards or Clark, you call uh, garden style, where you're doing this, how tall are these buildings? Oh, good point. We're, we're talking about in Miami-Dade County, most of these buildings are 49 feet and 11 inches tall. Coincidental? No. When they reach 50 feet, they require a standpipe. Excellent point, Mike. So these are non-standpipe buildings built by the builders, moved into by the people, and they are, and I'm not saying skirting the law or anything else, but they're using the law to their advantage not to put these in. Instead of having uh, seven and a half foot ceilings, they have uh, seven foot ceilings, and they bring the floor levels down a little bit more on each one so they can get by. And I understand it's a money thing, but for protection, it's not the best building for the people to move into. No, I really think that when you, when you look at a state of the art high rise, 75 feet above, state of the art, providing everything's working. It's a type 1 non uh, uh, fire resistant building. That is a much safer building than what you see throughout the United States in modern America, where uh, in, in, in most of uh, suburbia uh, it is wood frame, uh, two, three, four story, uh, what we call garden style, where you have either, uh, you're going to have a central stairway. That is going to open up to landings, and in each at each landing, you're going to have apartment 2A, 3A, 4A, uh, uh, apartment 2A, B, C, D, apartment third floor A, B, C, D. You get my point. Uh, that in, in the Sun Belt, that may be semi enclosed. Uh, in the northern states, it's going to be enclosed, but same the still the same centralized stairwell. And again, these buildings are surround usually a courtyard. Might be a swimming pool, might be landscaping. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is you're not going to be able to reach them with a 200 foot. 
Now, Captain, you we can answer your question. The majority in, in Clark County, the majority is three stories. That's, the, that's about the average we have is three stories, all exterior stairwell, um, all front doors open to the exterior via a long, long uh, balconies that run the whole length of the building. Okay. And, and, and remember, Clark, your world and my world is different than Mike's world. Right, absolutely. But I want our, our viewers and listeners to understand the buildings we're talking about because, again, the differences in the world, uh, we call these, uh, you know, like the buildings you're talking about with the center courtyard is an O-shaped building. It's When you look at it from the sky, it's yes. an O. Go through a center, and there could be four different apartment uh, stairs going to four different Common cock loft could be, uh, yes. could be um, apartments back up to each other, which I have done, gone up the wrong stair in the old building because they smelled the smoke. Well, realize the top floor in the all the way back down and back up, it's in that building, it's in that rear building that's unoccupied where the two apartments come together in that O and there's no firewall above the apartment. There's no firewall in the attic space, the cock loft. No, Mike, when you did that, were you on a truck or were you on an engine? I was on a truck. The engine never stretches until we know where the fire is. Bingo. Until we Bingo. say, we got it. We Bingo. got it. Because, very honestly, in a truck that time, I will be honest with you, we cheated. We went over the roof, forced the bulkhead, and went down the other side. Otherwise, we were going to be beat to our own fire. Didn't want that to happen. So that was a little bit of a cheat, but we did it. You guys that are operating with engines, and frankly, if you're on a Quint and you're first due, you're on an engine, bro. You're on an engine. I don't care what you want to call it. You're an engine. And uh, it's going to be a rare event where you're going to do truck company duties and operate that apparatus as a ladder apparatus when you're at first due with a quint. So that's just my opinion. Okay, that is not the opinion of anybody else. That's just me. Uh, I think quints are uh, a necessary evil. Again, in a perfect world, which we do not operate in, we wouldn't have quints. We'd have a fire stick house with an engine and a truck with four or five people on each rig, and they'd roll out the door, and we'd all do separate duties. But in our world, Mike, once again, we can't do that. So let me let me paint a picture of where you can go wrong with a Y. You stretch 400 feet into the courtyard of a garden or courtyard type apartment complex. And you connect up a 100 foot, inch and three quarter. Uh, we call it an extension pack uh, with an inch and uh, 15, 16 step. And we pump to supply one inch and three quarter line, flowing 185 gallons a minute. So you've got to figure the friction loss in, in our case, the three inch hose that's leading to the Y. The uh, friction loss in the Y, which we account at, at 15 psi, uh, and the friction loss in the 100 feet of inch and three quarter, which at 185 gallons a minute is 25 psi, and a nozzle pressure of 50. Okay, so everything's operating fine. Another company comes up and they add their hose line to the Y without any adjustment. If they connect their line to the Y and just yank the valve open all the way, there is a great potential that you will steal water from the initial line, and both lines will have insufficient flow and pressure. We did a, a test like this yesterday where we indiscriminately just opened the Ys all the way, uh, flowing one was just fine at 50 pounds nozzle pressure. We we were operating with the Y ball valve open all the way, maintaining the same pump discharge pressure that was sufficient to supply the one hose line. We added the other hose line by just connecting it and opening the valve all the way. The pressure at both nozzles dropped from 50 
which is the appropriate pressure flowing 185 gallons a minute to 20. Now this is one of the arguments about using a Y. Now, how can we avoid that drawback of using the Y? We figured it out. In Miami-Dade, it's called 150 PSI, set it, and forget it. We supply our three-inch hose with 150 PSI within a quite a wide range of using uh, a, a Y uh, connected to the three inch hose. It could be 200, 300, 400, 500 feet. It may be uh, it may be on the third floor of a parking garage. It may be on the third floor of a of a, a multifamily dwelling. Uh, it could be around the back of a warehouse. We start with a standard starting pressure of 150 PSI, and we control the flow, we control the pressure at the Y itself. We don't open the Y all the way. We open the Y sufficiently to pressurize the initial line. And then we have a pump discharge pressure sufficient to overcome the friction loss that will double when we add an additional line of the same flow. I hope I, I, I'm making this clear. Additionally, another problem with a Y is somebody comes and kicks the valve and either partially opens it or partially closes it. I believe it's absolutely essential if you are going to use a Y you have to be able to lock that discharge in the closed position so somebody doesn't kick it open. We operate our pumps with an automatic electronic automatic pressure uh, governor. When we attach a second line to a Y, and we double the flow in our trunk line. Remember now, the principle hydraulics is, is that if, if, if everything's laid out the same, the pressure after the Y is going to remain the same. The issue is, is that you double the friction loss, or you double the flow, and quadruple the friction loss in the trunk line. In my world, that's 3 inch. In Clark's world, that's 2.5. Therein lies the problem. We avoid that by one 150 PSI at the pump, set it and forget it. Number two, carefully opening the, the Y outlets with the nozzle open so we can judge the quality of the stream. Additionally, on our job, we use inline gauges on the discharge of the Y. In the case of a 100 foot hose bundle, with a 15 16 tip, we want to achieve a flow pressure as read on the inline gauge of 75 PSI, 25 PSI per 100 feet of key combat ready, that's what we use, and 50 pounds nozzle pressure, total 75. Now, what if I look at the inline gauge, and this applies to any time you use an inline gauge, I don't care if you're on a standpipe or what, if Clark's on the nozzle, and I'm on the outlet, and I tell Clark, okay, Clark, you're good, bro, you're good, you're, you're looking at 75, and he tells me, hey, old man, I got a crap stream here. Who do I listen to? Who do I pay attention to? The inline gauge or Clark? Well, no, I listen to Clark. We either got kinks, we got an inline gauge that isn't reading correctly, or maybe the frigging door. The stairwell door is closed on the hose line. So I'm reading 75, so I'll, oh, always listen to Clark. Okay, you can do that with a straight face, Clark. All right. Inline gauges have limitations. They are, they're, they are a good adjunct, but they're, they are not a substitute for the judgment of an experienced firefighter around the nozzle that tells me, hey, we're good. You set your pressure with the line flowing. You don't put yourself in harm's way until you've not only bled the line, forget, forget bleeding it, 
open that thing up and make sure you've got the proper reach and in the case of a fog nozzle that you have the proper pressure. And in my world at 150 psi pump discharge pressure that will be sufficient for us to charge an additional line in most cases. But if it isn't, we don't commit until we make sure that we do. But in almost all cases, that's how we avoid some of the shortcomings. 150 PSI, set it and forget it. Um, three inch line, which is more tolerant of increases in flow because of its, its less friction loss, way less friction loss than two and a half. Um, locking, locking gates, not gates, but locking ball valve. You know, we keep saying the word gated, why? It's not a gate, it's a ball valve. Uh, inline gauge and making sure you adjust your pressures with the nozzle open, possibly using an inline gauge, but more importantly, looking at the quality of your stream. Is there anything I forgot there, Clark, as far as how to reduce our problems with potential problems with the water. A um, couple of questions. questions. <coughs> um, um, how do you how lock do you the Y? Do you have an automatic locking Y or are you, are you lashing it with webbing? How do you lock that Y? Okay. We, we have two, two and a half inch ball valves. When you open the valve and you turn the knob, it's connected to a shaft and it, lo and it locks pretty tight. It locks pretty tight. And, I mean, you can kick it, uh, you can move it, and provided you lock that thing tight while the nozzle was flowing, things can happen, but you, you drastically reduce the chances of somebody kicking or knocking that, uh, that hose. I now, can't if, believe how... If you don't have the benefit of having that type of Y that you have that automatically locks, which is a luxury... Um, what uh, what would you recommend that we do to lock our valves in place? Can we? I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I've seen people do is leave somebody there. Okay. Leave, leave the backup okay. team that's going to go in when your guys are done. They're going to be right there with that Y, and they're going to stay there and make sure that nobody screws with it, and they're going to have a radio so they can hear what you're saying on that Y. And I have seen that done before in different places, and that's the way they do it. Their second engine team that's going to be your relief as the first engine, or their third engine team, whatever it is, is going to be right at that Y. And the officer has the communication, and he's watching those valves and making sure, and if you're saying our stream stinks, he's going to open it up a little more. And the one thing I see that you didn't mention with a problem is through the three inch sometimes and maybe through the, the ball valve we can sometimes get debris that's now caught in that nozzle and it could be we have a nozzle problem not a water flow problem and sometimes that person up there has to uh, open the nozzle either to the flush or shut down the nozzle and take a tip off to get I've had it where it's been a battery that was in a standpipe or something else that clogged the nozzle Mike, it's, it's, those are excellent points, and, and I think that whenever we address a problem, uh, I'm going to get to a, a giving a shout out to our, our sponsor. Uh, I just I want to relate something. It has to do with putting our heads together. Good, good. Uh, we had a, a, a drill the other day. Uh, once, once a month, we have a drill where we get four hours of uh, uh, time that we get out of service, which is precious for us because we're so heavily involved in running EMS calls. So in order for us to get drill time, is like pulling teeth. So uh, we get our, our drill time. And uh, I was not pleased with myself. I was not pleased with the way that we stretched the line. Uh, our, our training center has a tower, but it has, uh, it, it has the advantage that it has hallways. Uh, I think a training tower without hallways really gives you a false sense of Accomplishment because it you stretch you're going to end up stretching short if you have the muscle memory to stretch in its training tower. So our our training center has hallway. I wasn't happy how we did it. We got back to the firehouse, and that night I said, "Fellas, 
I'll take full responsibility. I was not happy with the way that we stretched from the stairwell onto the floor below in that hallway. Let's figure it out. And you know what? I wasn't the guy that came up with the best answer, the best way to do it. It was a, comp uh, a, 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 a guy on my company, a veteran master firefighter, said, hey, Cap, how about this? And for you company officers, especially your new ones, don't ever feel that you have to be the smartest guy in the room. You can be the boss and listen to your people. It doesn't mean that you're abrogating, that you're giving up your responsibility or your authority, but you're a fool. If you think that you have to make every decision, every tactic has to be something that you come up with, sooner or later you're going to demoralize your crew, and one of these days, your crew is going to sit there and watch you make a fool out of yourself and not say anything. A confident company officer listens to his crew and utilizes their strengths and their capabilities. And Bill, yes, sir. when you were stretching at that tower, were you using key hose? Well, that brings us to our, uh, yes, I was. And Brother, and let me tell you something. The hallways are narrow. Stairways are narrow. And this is why you don't test hose in a friggin' parking lot. When you're going to select hose to purchase for your department, you don't stretch a couple lengths out in a parking lot and stand there in your shirt sleeves. Oh, yeah, this looks good. Negative. You lay that hose out in a narrow stairway, lay that hose out in an S configuration, in a narrow hallway, charge it, move it, see if it kinks, see how it maneuvers in tight places, how it goes around corners. You don't check it in a parking lot. I wonder how many fire departments have made that mistake. And, you know, when you buy equipment, you know, it's going to last a good 10, 20 years. You're stuck with it. You know, it, it, it's, it's worse than getting married. Because you can get divorced. You can get divorced. Okay, you may end up losing your butt and living in your car. But you can get out of that relationship. But if you buy crappy hoes, you're stuck with it. Don't go cheap. Take the time to select it. Listen, let's be honest here, folks. There's other good brands of hose out there. Okay, I happen to like Key. I love Key. I stand by Key. Are there other brands? Heck yeah. Thank God for American capitalism. There's competition, okay? But having said that, be very careful about a brand name that looks American, but the hose is made in China, Captain Dubin. So, having said that, you can't go wrong with Key, especially their combat ready, but their other uh, less expensive grades are also quite good. Uh, I believe uh, FDNY has a, a proprietary uh, special um, weave or a special, what, is, what makes the FDNY hose FDNY hose, Mike? Well, um, they're looking at new hose now for more lightweight stuff. So um, the FDNY hose is the double jacketed. They want certain things because of the hallways. When you were talking about the O-shaped buildings, I've been at a fire in an O-shaped building on a higher one where it's, you know, six stories. And you go in in there, in that courtyard, there were four different doors to four different, uh, you know, building A, building B, building C, building D or building one, two, three, and four, and we were going in there, they stretched, and with your, if this was your trunk line, the truckies got up there and started taking windows. Glass came down right through the first thing hose line. The one I remember specifically was a 12-length stretch off the, off the engine because we, we stretch a static line. So it was four lengths of um, inch and three-quarter and the rest two and a half. It's a lot of hose to go through. And they got it. It was the center courtyard, top floor, back apartment, 
and uh, it was on the sixth floor. So again, you know, in New York City, it's six stories, 75 feet before you need a standpipe. You're a little less, but they didn't have a standpipe in the building. And, you know, stretching 12 lengths, they got it up there. Somebody took some windows, glass came down right through the hose line. That's one of the issues of always having your, your, all your eggs in one basket. If that three inch, if something happens to it, you know, somebody's throwing uh, stuff or you happen to be pulling it into the center courtyard and there's a, an old baby stroller there or they were barbecuing there and there's a, uh, um, an old grate from the barbecue or something. And again, it works very, very well unless there's a problem. So we have to have a backup for whatever we do. Okay, we have a backup line coming. It's a separate line. We'll only take two lines off this engine company. Then we're going to go to another engine company. We always have to have that backup in case there's a problem. I've, I've mentioned this before, Mike. Uh, my dad, and uh, a very experienced fire officer uh, in the Chicago Fire Department, 33 years on the job. Up until his last few years, he was always on a busy company. Uh, he used to, we used to have a discussion, and he'd say, Bill. What good is your backup line if it's coming off the same engine as your first line, your primary line, from the same water source? Now, I can't speak for the Chicago Fire Department today, but in his day, the second line at every fire would come off from a second engine connected to a second hydrant from a second water supply. So if the glass was the fault, or the truck was to run over the hose, or whatever, you would have a separate independent supply. And I know in our world today, with I'm a fire department like many throughout the United States and maybe the world, that forward lays from hydrant to fire a large diameter supply line. And brother, you talk about all your eggs in one basket. You let one little subcompact car drive up on that, in our case, five inch supply line, and either have the catalytic converter melt through the charged line or have the tires burn a hole in that hose, and we have lost our entire supply. And as much as we can say, well, you know, LDH is great, it can supply uh, well over a thousand gallons a minute. What happens is we become overly reliant on this, and we lose our capability of a backup. So there again, whatever you, whatever tactic you use, whatever you use, you better have a backup for if that doesn't work. Uh, Mike, you're a truck guy, a forcible entry. Uh, as an officer, don't ever expect. A, uh, a young uh, male, macho uh, firefighter that's that's uh, anxious to prove himself, uh, to turn around and hand you a halligan and say, "Hey, Cap, I'm not being successful at forcing this door. Let let's try something else, or let's try somebody else. Try it. It ain't gonna happen. You'll burn the friggin' building down. It's not gonna happen. That's why, as an officer in a in the ideal world." Keep your hands off the tools. You'll be a much better supervisor. Clark, you got some other things to add to the table? Yeah, Cap. Um, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that. Uh, that bad fire hose is worse than marriage. I, yeah, I, I can't agree with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess his wife is home. <laughs> oh. Okay, well... Uh, I can't agree either, Clark. I got to admit it. I just celebrated 30 years, so I can't. I can't disagree. I'm not going to agree with them on that one. But yeah, uh, I've got. To, we don't use key fire hose on my job, but I can still make the fire hose work. That's a completely different story at the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know who wears the pants in your family. Andrew. Absolutely, absolutely. I am because she told me I could wear them today. All right. Good. good, good. <laughs> um, now, Cap Gustin, you mentioned that uh, you use automatic pressure governors in Miami. All right, we yeah. we do that as well. We use a, a 
our engines come with a pump boss and these automatic pressure governors. And when when, you, when we did our testing with our Ys, we found that the, these automatic pressure governors actually compensated very, very well for the opening and closing of the two individual nozzles. We had inline pressure gauges on. Uh, we were using fog nozzles again, so we didn't use pitot tubes. We used uh, flow meters right behind the nozzles. And what we found is, as we are opening and closing really quickly, taking measurements, that these these uh, automatic it was called the pump boss. The automatic pressure governor really yeah, complicated well. Did you, uh, in your test, did you find that? Yeah, man, but make sure that you pump a pump discharge pressure to your, to your outlet connected to, in your case, the two and a half, in my case, the three. It is high enough to flow two lines. Remember that when you add a second line, you're going to double the flow in your trunk line. In my case, three inch. your case, two and a half. In, in hydraulic theory, that is when you double your flow, you quadruple your friction loss. So our, when I say our, you and me, obviously, it is compensating and maintaining that pressure that we have set for the capability of supplying two lines. In this case, it's going to remain, in our case, it's going to remain at 150. Do we need that entire 150? No, we don't. But that gives us a starting point and we gate down, so to speak, gate down, even though we're partially opening the valve and locking it, at, in our case, 75 PSI. Did that, I, think, I think we're in agreement on that. Yeah. Uh, yes. and, and again, hey, listen, are they always going to work? Uh, no. Uh, it, it, there's an argument there, man, you know, that we have become way, way too dependent on electronics. Uh, there's also an argument that can be made that a uh, good old uh, pressure relief valve is acts faster, reacts faster. Uh, it may be more reliable. Uh, that's just an argument out there. That's not coming from me. I, I personally have not had... Oh, yeah, I will, I will say one thing, if I, if I could say something. Um, have you ever experienced, Clark, with your pressure control governor, where if you're not very, very careful to bleed your supply line. Let's say you're operating off for your tank, and then you take in a supply line. If you do not bleed the air out of the supply line, there's any air in that supply line, you develop an airlock in the pump, the governor senses that the water is, the, the pump is being deprived of water, and it may automatically go back to idle. Has that ever happened to you? No, we have never experienced that, Captain. We never experienced that. That is a problem that we have experienced, and it's with all brands of automatic pressure control governments. So what do we do? We make sure we bleed our line. Hey, I'm a department that operates initially on residential fires off of a booster tank. Does that violate a basic axiom of fire? You've been basic tenant of firefighting. Sure, sure. We're operating off of a booster tank. In the ideal world, we'd have a hydrant every 300 feet, and we would be able to uh, begin operations off the tank, and then our engineer would be able to stretch and stretch a line to a hydrant. Well, that ain't happening, but that ain't just me. I would say that's the majority of the fire service outside of the big cities, and although I'm in the biggest fire department in the southeast United States, we're spread out. We operate like a big suburban fire department. So it is not unusual for us to uh, begin our operations off of a booster tank. Having said that, when you do that, you better, you better have in the back of your mind what the heck you're going to do if that second engine doesn't get there in time. It gets in an accident. In our case, it gets stuck in heavy traffic. It gets in an accident or it's stuck by a drop. Mike, I can see the gears turning. Oh, well, we, the city of New York operates on booster water all the time. And because fast water, fast knockdown. The reflex time, get the water on the fire. If we can't get to the hydrant, or let's just say we hooked up to a hydrant, and the hydrant's, or we pulled into a hydrant, the hydrant's dead. Now we're blocked off 
by uh, another rig or something else. We're going to ask a second engine, but the officer is going to say, give me booster water, and then the chauffeur is going to be talking to him. You're at three quarters. You're at half. You're at a quarter. We're running low. Get, get back wherever. And then you'll hear my favorite communication on fire ground, bar none. We have a positive water source. Okay, we got all the ammo we need in the weapons. We can do what we got to do because we got water to protect us. Okay, if you look at the line of duty, the NIOSH reports and everything else, lack of water in the fire is a huge problem. A lot of the guys who end up getting killed are truckies because you don't see many engine firefighters getting killed in the line of duty because they have water. They're putting fire out. So we all have to be aware of where the water's coming from, what's going on with the water, and listen to the sounds of the fire ground, how it's communicating to us. Absolutely. And, and, and every company uh, that uh, starts operations off of a tank should be in the habit. That engineer, I don't care if it's just a, a, a simple rubbish fire, should be in the habit of what you just said, Mike. Uh, in my case, engine two pump to engine two, we're at three quarters. Engine two pump to engine two, we're at a half a tank. Don't you think that that information has a strong influence on how aggressive we're going to be? Uh, don't you think that's going to have a, a huge bearing on whether we attack the fire itself or protect exposures? You better believe it. And like I say, when I hear engine two pump to engine two, we have established a water supply, man, that is music to my ears. Because at that point, we can then be a heck of a lot more confident and more aggressive. Now, Clark, in your job, do you start operations off your booster tank and then transition? Absolutely, yep. Absolutely, just because what you said, fast water, put the fire out quickly. Um, and the time it takes that first engine to pull up, Get those firemen off the rig, get that hose line down on the ground, get masked up, get on air, get your helmet back on, get your front door forced. Typically, 90% of the time, the second engine has arrived, caught the hydrant, and is in the process of laying in. So we are already actively in the process of establishing a water supply before we've even made entry into the threshold of the door. Because we are usually right on top of each other. Again, we are pretty fortunate in Clark County. We do have good staffing, minimum staffing of four. We have plenty of engines. Um, now, there are there are some suburban areas, some more rural areas that uh, we don't even have water supply, a good reliable water supply. All right, there's some, uh, we call it, uh, I can't remember the code, it's uh, rural preservation, which means minimum lot side, half acre, um, and you don't have to have a sidewalk, you don't have to have street lights. And in areas like that, we've got places where that's a thousand feet in between hydrants. Well, those companies know if you're working in that area, you already know. As soon as you get dispatched, you are looking for hydrants. The company officer is looking for hydrants, and he is making a plan because water supply is his primary concern when he rolls out of the door. But it's time to do Go ahead, Cap. Let me pose this question to you. You're operating off your booster tank, and the engineer or second company stretches a line to a hydrant, correct? Correct. Okay. Now... What type of pressure do you receive from that supply line? Uh, I mean, I realize it has to do with residual and how much you're flowing. I get that. Okay. But what I'm, the point I'm trying to get is when you're operating off of your booster tank, you're basically at like zero residual pressure on your master intake gauge. You're operating off of your tank. When you receive a supply line, what does that pressure pump up to? Uh, again, it could. It's all dependent on uh, the how how powerful the hydrant is, where, where its relationship to the mains are, things like that. But it is a considerable, considerable jump. Uh, how do you, uh, let's let's get let's get right to the chase here. How do you keep from knocking your guys on your butt when you transition from booster tank to uh, uh, hydrant? Um, well, in our our older generation of engines, the engineer would be opening the manifold and controlling. The, uh, the pressure relief valve simultaneously. Simultaneously. Go, and that is the old generation of engines. That's the old generation of engineers. 
Now, fast forward to now, we've got beautiful, beautiful engines, top of the line, and uh, these automatic pressure governors we have on there. He just opens it up, and that automatic pressure governor compensates very well and on my engine. I, I couldn't believe when they showed us this automatic pressure governor was the first one I'd ever seen, and I couldn't believe that it was going to do what they promised us it would do. And so we took it out, and we were opening, and we were trying to water hammer two and a half, inch and three quarter attack lines. We were opening, we were closing stuff. We had the master stream going, and we could not get that automatic pressure governor to fail. And so the brand new engineer says, hey, piece of cake for me. Piece of cake for me. Click, 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 click. Yep. Yeah. Set it and forget it, bro. Set, Set it and forget it. Okay. Utilize the technology, but train your people on the old way. Uh, first of all, it, 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 it's like cutting a hole in a roof. Nobody has any business cutting a hole in a roof, whether on a drill or a fire. So the same goes with the electronics. Practice the transition. That when you're taking a line into your apparatus and you're opening up an intake valve, that you're watching your intake pressure, you're watching your discharge pressure, and you're getting back. Now, back in the old days, when you were still in Pampers, Captain Lapping, well, you may still be, well, you know what? The one thing with you is, Clark, you were in Pampers, and then eventually you'll be in Pampers again if you're lucky enough to live long enough. But back in the old days, you had to also close your tank to pump valve when you received an outside source of water because there was no clapper in the tank to pump. You see, nowadays, the, there's a clapper in there, and when you receive a positive supply of water, that clapper closes and the tank can't be backfilled through the tank to pump. What I like to do is, as soon as you get a positive water supply, crack that tank fill valve and refill your tank. That's your insurance policy. And Mike, you were talking about listening to the fire ground. Our engineers are not wedded to that pump panel. If they're working and they hear that pump throttle up, something happened to our external water supply and the automatic pressure control governor had to throttle up and it is now taking suction from the booster tank. What happened? Somebody drove their Subaru, not bashing Subaru, Toyota up on the supply line and we melted a hole in it. I am looking at 159 and uh, is there anything, Mike, that you want to follow up on before we say goodbye for the next month? No, but I think you and I talked earlier, and I think we should tell our people what we're going to talk about next month so they can come in and join us, because I think we're going to talk about saws next month. Yes, we are. And, uh, again, this is, uh, as technology increases, uh, uh, there's very few departments I know now that are using composites aluminum oxide or silicon carbide blade. Oh, when I say blade, negative. It's a grinding wheel, and that's the problem. It's a different technique than cutting wood. Uh, we will have the rest of our... The other thing I want to talk about is how we connect a second line from a standpipe. Was that a catastrophe? Uh, well, it could be a catastrophe, which we'll talk about next month. You know, we went pretty much unscripted uh, today. And we had a small group, and um, uh, I don't even like you guys, but I must say that um, uh, there's just certain things that I take take away from. Okay, uh, and one is is uh, the involvement of the engineer, uh, the tank levels, uh, the idea of keeping somebody on a Y. If it was my department and I could not lock off the Y, I would have to leave somebody there at that Y. No. It, 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 is this going to be a phantom firefighter? Where are we going to get it? I don't know. It's going to have to be a priority. We're looking at 2 o'clock. Okay. What we talked about today is not exotic. It's not about bailout harnesses. It's not about rapid intervention companies. It's not about hazardous materials, all of which is important. But if you want to guarantee that your firefighters are going to need a rapid intervention company, deprive them 
of water on the fire scene. That is as basic as it gets. Whether you're on an engine or a truck, it's as basic as it gets. If you don't have water, you have nothing. So until we get together for next month, Clark, Captain Mike, thank you so much. And Key, Key Hose. Thank you so much, Key. I'll be using you day after tomorrow. Uh, it, um, it's, I rely on you heavily. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a easy endorsement for me. You can't go wrong with Key Hose. Whatever brand you select, don't go cheap. Don't try your hose out in a parking lot and make that selection. Otherwise, you will end up living in your car. Somebody's calling me. Hey, everybody, until next month, stay safe. Stay healthy, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Goodbye for next month.